Welcome to Hope Community Chapel. It's good to have you folks joining us again today. We thank you for joining all over uh, the United States and some from Canada and all over the place, even down in Brazil. Elijah, how are you doing? It's good to have you. Out in Indiana, how are you doing, Liz? Um, so this morning, I want to do a couple announcements with you that we've got uh, going on. And these are some upcoming events and some things that we need to address as well. Number one is our cleaners. Um, if you are already signed up on a cleaning crew, I'd like you to contact uh, Kenny Jepson so that he can schedule you to come in each week to do that. And then if you would like just to come in and wipe things down between the services, we would love for you to contact Kenny Jepson as well so that we can schedule some folks differently. It only takes about 15 minutes at the most. We just need to spray all of the doorknobs and, and uh, around the bathrooms and different things like that, just wiping things down that people normally would be touching as per CDC guidelines. So uh, speak to Kenny Jepsum specifically for that. The next thing I want to uh, share with you is, and I know I just stepped off camera, but that's okay, I'm coming back. Uh, baby bottle blessings. We usually start in Mother's Day and go right through to Father's Day. This year, the Aspire Women's Center is actually putting your donations and everything that you can make online so you can go there as well. Please look at uh, any of our uh, emails that we're sending out. We have the links and stuff that you can go there and be able to put your donation there. But if you would like a baby bottle, um, we have several here at the church and you're welcome to stop by and get one. I'll be glad to give it to you so that uh, you can fill that up just like you would normally and we'll send those back as well. Um, next, I just wanted to share about uh, men uh, all the men in the church, so fathers and sons and all of our men, uh, we'd like you to be here on the 19th 
of June. That's 19th. That's Father's Day weekend. Uh, at 4 o'clock, we're going to do the cleaning of the church like we normally do. We're going to get back into that habit. And then uh, at 5.30, the ladies are going to do something very special for us. They're going to cook a sit-down dinner for us right here at the church uh, and, and serve us. So come on out. You don't want to miss that. But uh, we want you to help us clean to begin with so that we can be ready because we know that the ladies are going to be ready for us. And then finally, uh, we haven't celebrated communion in a little bit because of the uh, time that we've been away. And so tonight at our drive-in service, we will be celebrating communion, 7 o'clock right here at the church. Uh, we'd love for you to come and join us as well. Thank you, folks. Have a great week. Enjoy the service. And uh, please uh, just type something in the sidebar if you're on YouTube or whatever with us in the chat. Just let us know how God has blessed you this week and how we can pray for you. God bless. Pour out our praise to you.
difficult week all around our country, even in our own state. And so this morning, we just want to go before the Lord and pray and, and ask for his peace, ask for his care, and uh, just ask him to bring uh, a calm and a control to our country, but also our lives as well. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, as we come before you, we thank you that in all the earth and all of heaven and in all of creation, there is no God but you. That even as around this globe, but specifically in our country, riots and um, bricks and fires and everything rage around us, you are not out of control and you have not lost control. This morning we come to you and we worship you. We adore you. And Father, there are times throughout this week that we are at a loss for words. There's nothing to type and there's nothing to say that would make this situation better. We can just go to our knees and, and beg you to have mercy upon our souls. This morning we cry out and we ask for wisdom. We ask wisdom for us that we would know how to pray, how to love those who are on both sides of this equation. Father, how to proceed forward so that we bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ. We come before you and we pray specifically for our leaders and we ask for our president, Father, that you would guard, guard his, his mouth, guard his fingers. Lord, help him to realize the position that he holds. And may we be gracious, understanding that this man has not been trained to be the president of the United States. He's been trained all of his life to lead businesses. And that is not an excuse. For we all have been trained to be polite and demonstrate etiquette. So we pray your mercy upon him, that he would understand the weight of his position the example that he must show. We ask that you forgive him and that you bolster him by your grace and your power. Strengthen him in that position that you would humble him and he would be humbled. And that by your gentleness and through your grace he would begin to share and bring our country together as that leader we ask you to make him. We pray for those leaders that are around him, Vice, Pre uh, Vice President Pence and, and the cabinet and all those men and women that give him counsel. We ask that you give them wisdom. Lord, even if it's something that he does not like, I pray that they would speak the truth with honor and with respect. And Father, they would, they would stand with you. I pray that you strengthen them. Give them resolve. Lord, give them ear to the president that he would learn to trust them and rely on them. I pray for our Congress and our Senate. And Lord, it is so divided and it is so... Lord, there is where the riots begin, right there. And I ask that you bring peace. Stop the division. Stop the singling out and the prejudices that are found there even in the hierarchy of our government. And Father, bring your mercy, for we need your mercy. And this morning we come because we desperately need your grace. We need something that is not ours. We need something that is supernatural. We need your power and your presence in our midst and throughout the churches of the United States of America. Father, I pray that you raise up individuals from the pew, from the streets, from their homes, that we would stand to worship and to adore you and to demonstrate peace and grace. And Lord, what true love from heaven actually looks like. 
where there is no prejudice, where there is no discernment of, of colors or races or slants of eyes, Lord, where we fall on our hands and knees before your cross as one people because we flow from the blood of Adam. You didn't create this division. Next week we come to that psalm that teaches us how good it is for brothers to dwell in unity. And we need that this morning. We need that today. We need that in our lives. And so we come begging you, begging you to show mercy upon our souls and in this country and spare us once again from ourselves. Father, I pray right now that you would give us grace with one another because no matter what, we see this world like a prism in so many different shades and colors and glorious differences for each one. May we not pigeonhole any of us with any, read into anything that we text or say or anything like that. Lord, may we walk in your grace and with your love one for another. Lord, thank you that you are a merciful God. Thank you that you love us despite our wickedness. And I thank you that you look down from heaven and that you have called us your own. May we grow up in Christ to actually demonstrate that maturity. I pray that this morning for everyone who listens, for our entire country, and Father, for those who desperately need that peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Thank you for joining us, and if you have your Bibles, open to Psalm 131, 131, that is uh, where we are in our study of the Psalms of Ascent. Let's read it this morning. 
O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters, or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul, like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. You know, as we're studying this particular psalm, it's one of the shortest. There's four that are three verses, um, and this is one of them. David is the writer of this particular psalm. He's speaking from somebody who grew up as a child tending sheep, uh, rose up in the ranks after killing Goliath, serving the king, and watching everything. So he grew up seeing great expectation and great marvel as God was using him. And so here's an individual who could have begun to dive into pride and all that it would have. But then um, we hear him write this as he watches God's hand upon his life, caring for him. We stop and we look around at the world that we are in right now. And, and I think next week's psalm actually addresses the situation more appropriately. So I'm not going to dive into uh, it, it's not racism. Let's, let's be honest. It has nothing to do with racism because there are no races. We all draw from the blood of Adam. Somehow God created one man, one woman, and we all descend from them, whether we believe in Christ as our Savior or not. What this boils down to is the sin of prejudice. You see, because we begin to carry out these atrocities and wickednesses um, upon people, we have something against, and that's a prejudice. And so I'm going to dive into that a little bit next week. I'm not going to address it this week. What I do want to say just briefly in this moment as well as we dive into this particular study is, you know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior. I pray that you do who are listening this morning, especially from Hope Community Chapel. One of the things that grieves my soul is watching believers in Christ, disciples of Christ, begin to take sides and divide one another over issues like this. May I speak to your hearts this morning and ask you to walk wisely and choose grace. Walk wisely and choose grace. You don't have to say anything to be appalled at someone murdering another person. You don't have to say anything to watch someone who has power and authority abuse it and know that that is wrong. Sometimes we just need to stand in complete awe and devastation at what is before us, repenting and crying out to God to have mercy upon us. Please don't read into things in people's comments or behavior. Fall upon your knees, walk in grace, speak from grace. This morning you'll notice that the title of the sermon here is The Wayfarer's Secret to a stress-free life. And, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't that be great after the weeks that we have been having here, um, whether it be kids who are finishing up school and didn't want to do it to begin with, or whether it is somebody who's had to be on the computer all day and working from home and people getting upset because their deliveries are not coming on time from Amazon or from some other place, and they, they now have a time frame that they've got to get work done and they're never able to rest or do anything there. Um, whether it's babies that you literally cannot get away from now at all at, at any point because there are people all around and you, you just need that break but you can't find one. You're sick and tired of looking at the four walls that you have been in for the past two months. Uh, you, you name it. You're tired of the news. You're tired of the Facebook feed. You're tired of, of um, these texts and demands and you're just tired and overwhelmed and completely exhausted from the stress of everything that you're under. And how do you get to a stress-free life? Do you just ignore everything on the planet and turn it all off and just make your own little utopia wherever you may live? It just isn't possible because we still need to live and deal and walk around and go to the grocery store and, and bump into people that have been immersed in it. So how do we live the stress-free life? Because that's something we desperately need. So with our Bibles open, let's dive in. And, and I want to challenge you that stress 
really is induced because of pride. Stress is induced because of pride. Listen to the definition of pride from Oxford Dictionary. I'm only going to read a couple, but it has five different subheadings as to the definition. I think I've, what I find interesting is the first couple. It says, a, a feeling or deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements, the achievements of those with whom one is closely associated, or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired. Number two, confidence and self-respect as expressed by members of a group, typically one that has been socially marginalized on the basis of their shared identity, culture, or experience. Finally, a pride also is a group of lions forming a social unit. But that's, notice that definition, um, as from Oxford Dictionary, actually seems quite um, appropriate. We would say, that, that's, that's nice, that, that's not a bad thing whatsoever. The reality, though, when we're talking about pride, listen to what Noah Webster wrote in his 1828 Dictionary. Inordinate self-esteem, an unreasonable conceit of one's own superiority in talents, beauty, wealth, accomplishments, rank, or elevation in office, which manifests itself in lofty ears, airs, distance, reserve, and often in contempt for others. Number two, insolence, rude treatment of others, insolent exaltation. That's typically what we're used to when it comes to the issue of pride. Notice how the world has co-opted what the Bible teaches about pride to make it almost seem tolerable and actually a, a good quality to have. Pride within Scripture is never used in a good way. Pride is, is seen as something that separates us from Almighty God. I find it interesting that in less than 200 years, and you say 200 years, if you look at the development of language, it usually takes a long time for words to change their meaning. Since late 1800s, um, our language has gone under an enormous amount of transition and words that used to mean something specifically now have been turned into something completely different, pride being one of them. So how do I test myself and see if I'm proud? How do I see if I'm, I'm proud? Notice in Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You've been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Isaiah was writing this. This was about the king of Babylon. But we also believe this was what um, Satan originally Lucifer said before he was thrown out of heaven because of his rising trying to take over God's position his insurrection five different I will statements so how do I test to see if I'm full of pride or if I have pride in my life ask yourself these five questions and you can write these down if you like I'll say them, and, and they associate or they, they coincide with each one of the I statements that Satan asked or stated. Ask yourself, have I ever said, I can do it by myself. I don't need any help. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. That goes right along with verse 13. I will ascend to heaven, Satan said. Have I ever said I can do it myself? I don't need any help. Number two, have you ever said, I deserve this because I did, you fill in the blank, such a good job, or, or I worked so hard, or I got an A, or, or I saved all this money. Have you ever said, I deserve this because I did? Listen to scripture from Job. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Nor, now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who set its measurements, 
since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who enclosed the sea with doors when bursting forth it went out from the womb? When I made a cloud its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. And I placed boundaries on it and set a bolt in doors. And I said, thus far you shall come but no farther. And here shall your proud waves stop. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? Have you ever said, I deserve this because I did such and such? That goes right along with verse 13. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. The stars of God, what Satan was saying is, I'm going to be greater than all the angels that God has ever created because look at what I've done. Question number three. Have you ever said, if it were up to me, I would have done such and such? Listen to scripture in Romans chapter 3, verse 4. May it never be, rather let God be true. Though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that thou may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. This goes right along with verse 13 when Satan says, And I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. What he was literally saying is where, where these angels rule and, and guard out somewhere where God has placed them, I'm going to be the head of that ruling council if I were in charge. If I were to have done it, I would have done such and such. Question number four. Have you ever thought, if I were not here to take care of them, they would be lost? These people can't do anything without me. Listen to John 15, 5. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him he bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. When we begin to think that way, have we ever thought, if I were not here to take care of them, they would be lost? These people can't do anything without them. We set ourselves up just like Satan did in verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Look at, look at what I can do. Look at my position. Look at my control. Question number five, have you ever thought, I can't be stopped. There is no one who can keep up with me or who is even close to my abilities. I am great. God himself wrote in Exodus chapter 9, verse 14, For this time I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. As great as you may think you are, there is no one like Almighty God. When we say that or think that, we actually set ourselves up with verse 14 when Satan said, I will make myself like the Most High God. So I ask that question again. How do I test myself and see if I'm proud? You see, because with pride comes desires, expectations, and we begin to add layers and layers and layers of things to do, people to see, expectations that we need to live up to, everything of that because of pride in our lives. And pride, if you're proud, brings stress. Because now you've got to meet a standard because of pride that we were not created to meet. So ask yourselves those five questions. Have I ever said I can do it myself, I don't need any help? Have you ever said I deserve this because I did such and such? Have you ever said if, I, if it were up to me, I would have done such and such, I'm the one in control? Have you ever thought if I were not here to take care of them, they would be lost? These people can't do anything without them, without me. And have you ever thought, I can't be stopped. There's no one who can keep up with me or is even close to any of my abilities. I am 
great. Well, what, what are we talking about here this morning? Why did I start there and go down that road? Because the wayfarer's secret to a stress-free life is this. It's Psalm number one, uh, verse number one of Psalm 131. O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great manners or in things too difficult for me. You see, the reality of what David is writing about is he has examined his heart. And if there's one that could actually see it because of everything that he had gone through, not just as a shepherd boy, as the one who killed Goliath, the one who had fought many battles and won them all, the one who had become anointed and then became king. If there was one who would be susceptible to pride, that was not one of the markers of David's character in his life. And as he's writing this, he's not evaluating himself against um, another individual on this earth. He wasn't evaluating himself against the other mighty men that he had raised up that scripture talks about. He wasn't evaluating himself against you or I. What he was doing was he was coming to Almighty God and looking at what God required of him. And he realized he's not trying to outdo God. In his heart, he really, he wasn't proud. And so when he says, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, realize this. The Bible tells us that where, where our treasure is, there will our heart be also, right? No, that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says, where my heart is, there will my treasure be also. The reality here, folks, is my eyes always disclose the condition of my heart. My eyes always disclose the condition of my heart. And so if I'm looking down at people that somehow I'm better than somebody else, that's a prejudice, that's a sin. And what David was writing here is he wasn't saying that because he is now king and he's worked his way up the ladder that somehow he is better than anybody else. He's saying, no, it's by the grace of Almighty God. It was because you did these things in my life, Lord. I am no better than the one who sweeps or cleans in the palace. My heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. I'm not setting some kind of expectation or setting some kind of goals to better so that the world says, look at, look at David, look how great he is, or look at Glenn, see what he's all accomplished. And this is really hard to do, right? We, we teach our children from an early age to set these lofty goals, to leave a mark on the world. So what we're really doing is reinforcing inappropriate pride in their lives instead of saying, God, how do I come alongside of you and do what you ask of me and what you want for me? David writes here, O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in the things too difficult for me. So if I'm going to have the secret to a stress-free life, I need to develop the humility of Christ. David knew, God had promised him when he became king that one of his family, as long as he obeyed and walked with him his entire life, would always sit on the throne. David even prophesied of that at different times throughout his his, uh, reign and throughout the poems that he wrote in the book of Psalms. And as we're looking at this, I truly believe he's thinking about the one who would come and reign on his throne for eternity, the Messiah that would come through his lineage. And so if we're going to live a a stress-free life, we need to develop the humility of Christ. And Paul writes about that in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. 
have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. If, if you want to develop a stress-free life, you got to develop humility. And the best example of humility is Jesus. And I want you to realize that humility is not thinking that any job is too low for you or thinking that caring for any individual is beneath you in any way or that it's not worth your time or your effort. You see, humility sees people through the loving eyes of Jesus Christ and serves them by his grace. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Well, if I do this for so-and-so, it's going to progress my career, or people are going to see what I'm doing for so-and-so, and they're going to think better of me. That's empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. This person is in such a need. What would they do for me? I need to love them because Christ loved me. And so I go out of my way to care for them. Listen, I want you to stop and think about this right now. Stop looking at people's posts on Facebook or Twitter or, or uh, Instagram or anything like that. Stop looking at it. How have they lived their lives? The time that you've known them, who lives in the house with them? How many times have they stopped and gone and helped somebody change a tire or go pick somebody else up or, or what's going on? Stop looking at the fun pictures that advertise about this incredible life in their selfies and everything else and start looking at what happens when nobody else sees them. How are they living their lives truly for God in humility? They don't care what their house looks like they say, come in anyways. They don't care what they're putting on the table for dinner. They say, please sit down. You're welcome. Have some with us. They don't care what they have in their pocket for money. They say, how can I help no matter what? They don't care how pressed for time they are. They say, you know what? I always have time for you. They're encouraging. They're gentle. They're merciful. They're gracious. Yes, they have bad days on occasion, but the majority of their time is that they go around and they lift up and they graciously serve one another because of humility. If you want a stress-free life, develop the humility of Christ. Because Jesus is the ultimate example. He demonstrated gracious servitude even unto death. Now, listen to these verses because I'm going to ask you a couple of questions as well as we go through this. Jesus is recorded by John in John 15, verses 4 and 5, say, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Let me ask you a couple of questions here. Are you trying to grow spiritual fruit that only comes from Jesus and a deeper, loving, obedient relationship with him produces? Are you trying to do this on your own? Are your fruits tart and hard and making those around you sick because you're trying to pick them too soon before they're ripe? Abide with Jesus. Wait on the Lord. Walk with him a while and let your life ripen as your relationship grows deeper in his love. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, Jesus is that vine. Unless you abide in me, I am the vine, he says, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. I can tell you how you're acting by what you're saying, what you're doing. I can tell you who your friends are. 
And I can also tell you when you are growing deeper in Jesus and you're abiding with him by what you say and what you do. Are you trying to produce spiritual fruit that only comes from a spiritual relationship? Even disciples of Jesus Christ try to do that. They know what the Bible says, so they try to do it on their own. But the problem is they're not developing the humility of Christ. They're trying to do, develop a, a uh, godliness but deny the power thereof, Peter writes. So the reality is the only thing that's going to grow this spiritual fruit and for me to get rid of the pride and not to pick that fruit too soon is to walk and abide with Jesus. My relationship with Jesus must ripen and grow deep and passionate in his love. Listen to these verses. And they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands on them. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And the man said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go and sell all you possess. Give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. But at these words, he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again, said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, With people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has ever left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. You see, why did I read that big, long passage? The reality of that is, are, are you, um, these are the questions I want to ask about that. Is Jesus enough for you? Are you upset that your needs are not being met? Or your perceived needs are not being met? Are you dissatisfied, envious of others? especially other Christians? Do you get upset when your spouse, your family, your friends, or others do not see what you see or what you think they should, should be obvious to everybody? Are you looking at following Jesus? Remember what, what Peter exclaims. He says, but we've left everything for you. How are we ever going to get into heaven? We expected that by walking with you, by doing all this stuff, that that would buy us some kind of benefit and that we would get into heaven. And Jesus wipes that all away. And he talks about a relationship with him and him alone. That's why he told that man, go sell everything that is important to you. Get rid of it and follow me. Enter into a relationship with me. That's why this passage started with, come as a little child. 
Children know they got nothing. But they come running into their dad. They come running into their mom. They come running into those that they know will provide their need. And they just ask. But are you entitled? Are you upset that people aren't, aren't seeing your needs the way you want? And that's causing you stress. Because you expect people to know, well, my spouse has lived with me for 26 years now. They should know better. Well, they know who I am. They should be able to talk with me. You know, some people sleep well at night because they haven't got a clue how they've offended you or what they did that you're upset about because you're not communicating. You have an expectation that's causing you stress because Jesus just isn't enough. His grace somehow isn't enough. Now let me read another passage to you. Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And then if you jump down to verse 19 of Philippians chapter 4, it says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Are, are you upset with Jesus because all he gave you was salvation? I know, that's a hard question to ask, right? Well, what is he talking about? Is he nuts? Are you angry that God chose to bless other people more than you? Are you upset that it seems like you have to work for everything and other people? It comes just so easy. Is Jesus enough? Think about that question I asked you. Are you upset that Jesus has forgiven your sin and given you salvation? But you're upset with somebody else because they get salvation and they get um, everything else that they wanted, supposedly. How do we look through the eyes of grace with envy and jealousy? Because that's not developing humility. And the second thing that we need to do from verse number two is discipline yourself to desire only Jesus. If the first thing we have to do is develop the humility of Christ, the second thing we need to do here is discipline ourselves or yourself to desire only Jesus. Surely, David writes in verse 2, surely I have composed and quieted my soul. This is hard work here. That composure, that quieting of my soul takes self-denial. It takes discipline. It takes perseverance. It takes failure and trying over and over again. It takes submission. This is a work I have to do with the power of the Holy Spirit who is in me to discipline myself to want and desire and enjoy Jesus only. It takes work through the Holy Spirit with me to quiet my soul. That composed and quiet is a Hebrew word that several different things that are going on, but one of them is, is really interesting. It's about, you know, as you're finishing or you're just finishing planting your garden, you're making these, these furrows or these, these little rows through your garden to plant corn or plant your beans or, or you're bringing up these little hills and it's talking about how those get leveled. You work to level them so everything is on the same playing field. You've, you've worked to quiet your soul. You've worked to get rid of all those things that are uneven and causing you stress by seeing and wanting only Jesus. Look at that. David writes, 
Surely I have composed and quieted my soul. I've worked it out and disciplined myself to learn to rest in my mother's arms. Notice the second part of verse 2. Like a weaned child rests against his mother. Not only have I worked to quiet and compose my soul, I am now going to work to say, listen, I don't need the milk my mother provides for me anymore. I just need that relationship with her. And in this particular case, I I don't need anything from Jesus. I just want to be with him. That wean child, in fact, this week, on on one of the days in the evenings, um, one of our daughters brought their children over, and I just, I was watching them play and and, uh, watching one of them swing in the swing, and they were just having one of their ornery days. And as uh, I took her out of the swing, and as she came to me real quick because she wanted to get out of the swing, but then she saw her mom, and she wanted to go to her mom, you know, one right after the other. Like, thanks, Grampy, you got me out of the swing, but I really want my mom. And then when she got in her mom's arms, she just settled right down. That's where she wanted to be. She wanted her mom. Notice what David writes. Surely I've composed, I've worked and leveled everything so that I'm now at rest and I want nothing but Jesus. Like a weaned child rests against his mother. Now, notice, he moves from this illustration of being a weaned child that we can really relate to and now he goes back to his soul. We can identify with a child just resting Um, in his mom's arms or in her mom's arms to now I've worked notice that first part surely I've composed and quieted my soul I've worked to level everything there's no more stress in my heart because like a child I want nothing but Jesus so my soul my soul where the stress and the envy and all that that grief that I I bear I worked it out because all I want is Jesus So my soul is at rest. And when my soul is at rest and I desire only Jesus, I'm living a stress-free life. Can you really say that? Or do you want a bigger house? You really want to go on a vacation so you got to work more hours. Or I, I really want my kids to stop arguing and fighting and so you're going to wade into all of this. Or, or I want whatever. And, and so you, you actually create more rows of stress in your life instead of leveling it and resting in the arms of Jesus. I've worked it out and disciplined myself to learn to rest in my mother's arms calmly and quiet and at rest, not wanting anything but to be with and in my mother's arms just because I love her. It's about the calming influence of that relationship. It's about the calming influences of being and wanting Jesus. My soul now, not my body, my soul rests in and is completely content and at peace in my relationship with the Lord Jesus. Can I challenge you this morning that maybe that's why so many of you don't have peace in your lives, that you're with unrest, that there's conflict in other relationships. It's because you're not at complete rest with Jesus. He isn't all that you want and all that you need. Listen to these verses. Psalm 46.10 says, Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. Are you striving against God or are you resting in him? Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I am will give you rest. Take my yoke. He's not saying don't work. He's not saying lay on the couch and play video games. He's not saying just just give up, collect welfare. And I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. What I'm saying is he's not saying just don't do anything, I got this. Because that's not what scripture talks about. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you. Take, learn from me. Take my life, my example, who I am, my relationship on you. Learn how I deal with life. Because I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, if, if, if your friends are taking precedent, then Jesus isn't. And I can tell when you're hanging out with friends because they talk a certain way and they have a particular philosophy of life and that bleeds over on you and it generates a conversation in you and it makes you ask questions and live a certain way. Show me your friends and I'll show you, I'll show you whether you're content in Jesus or not. If your friends are striving after Jesus and resting in Jesus, then you're going to be more at peace too. But if your friends are, are not, then they're going to be riling you up as well. And Jesus isn't the only thing you want, and Jesus isn't going to be your answer. But you've got to discipline yourself to desire only Jesus, for he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Colossians 1, 15 to 18. So if you're going to have a stress-free life, if you want to know the secret to every wayfarer's stress-free life, the first one is to develop the humility of Christ. And the second thing is to discipline yourself to desire only Jesus. Now I want to stop right here because that final verse we're going to get to, and it's very short, and what I want you to realize is these first two are about a life that is lived. And so we're not talking about 10 minutes. We're not talking about two weeks. We're not even talking about two years. We're talking about a lifetime of devotion. A lifetime of devotion. That you're putting these things into practice. You're working these out. You're making these part and parcel of your life and your character and the way you walk on a regular daily basis over the course of your lifetime. And so your stress-free life is going to grow stress-free. It's not immediately going to become stress-free. And so as you continue to develop humility and work that into your life, and as you continue to desire Jesus in that relationship only, then you're going to see that all the worries and anxieties and concerns and frustrations and, and all the chaos and anarchy of the world begins to roll off of you. Because whatever Jesus asks of you, you humbly obey and you go do. And even when life doesn't seem to be turning out the way that you want it to, Jesus is enough for you. You've developed the character of humility because you've developed the character of Christ, the mind of Christ, and you've disciplined yourself to desire Jesus only. Now, look at verse 3. O Israel, hope in the Lord for from this time forth and forever. You know, right now in this world and the chaos that is going on, there is nothing more important than for disciples of Jesus Christ to display peace and confidence in Jesus in all circumstances. To display peace and confidence in all circumstances because of Jesus. I want you to notice right here, David writes, because of his choices and the way that he has been living, he is noticing that, that he is living stress-free and he's made some major mistakes 
Not only did he have a baby out of wedlock and, and murder somebody, because of that, he saw his other son rise up against him and cause a coup and chase him down out of the kingdom. So David understands what it's like not to live in obedience, to live a stressful life instead of a stress-free life. But as he writes, he says, Oh, Israel, he writes as the king, he writes as the leader, don't learn from the experience of my life the way that I did it. Please, right now, hope in the Lord. Display peace and confidence in all circumstances. So if you're not, listen, it's a choice. If you want to live a stress-free life, it's a choice you have to make right now that you're going to hope in Jesus, that you're going to hope in God. You're going to say, okay, I've tried it my way long enough. It's not working. I, right now, I'm choosing to walk See, because what I said is true. It's a, it's a devotion for a lifetime. Remember, we stopped between verses 2 and 3 and said, you can, you can develop humility, you know, the character of humility. You can desire Jesus only. But if you only do that for a short period of time, you're going to quickly build up stress in your life again. But if you keep seeking after developing humility for an entire lifetime and keep devoting yourself to desiring Jesus only, you're going to notice that stress ebbs away and you're not dealing with it. Why? And now you can say and you can demonstrate and you can display to the world who so desperately needs it right now peace and confidence in whatever circumstance you're in because you made a choice to develop humility. You made a choice consistently to desire Jesus only. Therefore, your life displays peace and confidence in all circumstances. Folks, there's nothing that this world needs, your neighborhood needs, your family needs, your spouse needs, your kids need, your workers around you need, your friends need, but for you right now to confidently display peace because you're, you're humble and because Jesus is enough for you. Do you want the secret of a stress-free life? Do you want to be that wayfarer that leaves a legacy and leaves a mark that transforms generations and leads people to Jesus Christ for eternity? Then make the choice right now forevermore to develop humility and choose Jesus only. Will you pray with me today? Father, thank you. As we come before you right now, we need you more than anything. Humble us so that all we want is you. Help us not get caught up with our eyes or our hearts or our bodies in this world so much that we want the stuff of this world more than we want Jesus. And that includes friends and family, Lord. We give them up for you. You are enough for us. Christ is enough for me. And if I get nothing in this life but salvation, that is enough for me because that is more, more than I deserve to be saved and spending eternity with you. Remind us of your amazing grace and how it sustains me each and every day. Thank you for your mercy towards me, Lord, and empower me to be a testimony and a trophy for you. May my life display confident peace in all circumstances because you have developed humility in me because of the example of Christ and because I am devoted to Jesus only. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.